Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi to the folks uh, joining remotely. Um, I want to introduce you to Linda Kiki V or Kiki. Um, she's a popular educator of Maya Roots who saves seeds, makes art, and loves books. She organizes from Shumash and Tongva lands toward a world where many worlds fit. And she's going to be talking to us today about the philosophy and ideas of Zapatismo. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you all for inviting me here. Uh, the talk, uh, the title of the talk has pluriversal ontologies in there. And just want to know ontology is just a study of what makes a thing a thing, like what's the nature of being. And something that we're going to talk about is what's the nature of the world, of a world. And what is what, what kind of people do we want to be? So these are like really live questions with the Zapatista movement that they offer us that we a lot of us find really generative. I'm not going to give too much of a background on the Zapatistas. I know that there are varying levels of knowledge in the room. I can say there's a lot of stuff written about the Zapatista history. Um, and initiatives, there isn't as much written about their political theory and philosophy. So we're gonna do more theory and philosophy together with practice and, and show you where you can uh, learn more about that. And I begin with this slide about Marcos being gay. So Subcomandante Marcos was the spokesperson of the Zapatista uh, Army for National Liberation, it's an armed, an armed movement with also bases of support that aren't par part of the military. And when they first rose up against the Mexican government on January 1st, 1994, some Mexicans weren't happy about that. And Mexico being a very machista society, sadly, wanted to discredit the movement by calling their spokesperson gay. And the Zapatistas replied, well, like, yeah, Marcos is gay. Like, that's not an insult. Marcos is a lot of other things, but you notice that in context, Marcos is gay in San Francisco, Black in South Africa, and Asian in Europe, Chicano in San Isidro, an anarchist in Spain, a Palestinian in Israel, a Mayan Indian in the streets of San Cristobal, a Jew in Germany, a Gypsy in Poland, a Mohawk in Quebec, a pacifist in Bosnia, a single woman on the metro at 10 p.m., a peasant without land, a gang member in the slums, an unemployed worker, an unhappy student, and of course, a Zapatista in the mountains, right? We're gonna come back to this, but what, what we're, what's important about it is that there's context, there's not just identity, okay? Move on to the next slide. I also wanna preface this talk by saying, I am no spokesperson of the Zapatistas. There is no official anything in the United States about the Zapatistas that is known. The Zapatistas are their own spokespeople and you can find their word on their own website. And we're gonna uh, share these slides with you, with everyone who's registered and beyond and they all have hyperlinks and um, we're gonna be moving fast. So I just don't want you to worry that you're gonna miss some stuff because everyone will be able to, to look at these slides. So if you want to ever see if there's anything official from the Zapatistas, it will always be on their website. If it's not on their website, they likely did not say it. Oh, I'm sorry, if we can just go back. This is the front page of their website right now. It says, Alto a las guerras, stop the wars. Right now, maybe if you've been following, the Zapatistas are experiencing an enormous amount of violence by paramilitary groups, which are sadly other Native Americans fighting them, and they are supported by corporations and the Mexican government. And it's a way for the Mexican government to mask their conflict with the Zapatistas as just brown people versus brown people, Indians versus Indians. And so that's something that's very critical that's happening right now. And you can read about that on their website. There's a lot of stuff that gets translated. It's all volunteer translation from all over the world. And uh, if you'd like more information about that, I have my contact info at the, at the end of the slide. I'm happy to, to, to point you all into the directions that I know. Okay, next slide. This is, if you want to read one thing about the Zapatistas to get an understanding of who they are and what they're doing, it would be the sixth declaration. 
of the Lacandon jungle. This is on their website. And as you can see, there's an English, French, Italian, German, Portuguese, Arabic, and Farsi translation. The Arabic translation is actually the newest one. Um, Post-Arab uprisings have been really exciting. The sixth declaration is, um, it was published in 2005, 2006, and each declaration is kind of like a shift in strategy. The first declaration was a declaration of war against the Mexican government. And then they had different initiatives, dialoguing, trying to create new political formations, and they tried different things. And they decided that after having been lied to and, and oppressed, even by the government while they're having discussions and dialogues with them, they were no longer going to speak to the governments above, the politicians, the states. They're only going to speak to the movements from below and to the left. That's very specifically important and to the left because there are movements from below, but they're not always emancipatory. So if you'd like to read one document as an introduction, it would for sure be their own words, the Sixth Declaration of the Lacandon Jungle. This was a very controversial document. A lot of people stopped on the left, stopped supporting the Zapatistas after it was issued because they were upset that they were not gonna participate in electoral politics or with the state. And at that time, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador was running for president, got the election stolen, even though he won. And people blame the Zapatistas for his loss, just like they do all the time over here when you don't vote Democrat or Republican. Next slide. We're going to talk about four phrases, many phrases, but there are four that I wanted to highlight, pull out that you might hear quite a bit in the Zapatista orbit. A world where many worlds fit is something that we've talked about a little bit here in this space. You've probably heard it too. From below and to the left. To lead by obeying. Now this is, this is their political theory here in practice. And the fourth world war. And I'll just mention the fourth world war as context. We often hear about the First World War and the Second World War, and then we hear about this war called the Cold War, which if you were living in Central America, Central Africa, or Southeast Asia, it was not at all cold for you. It was a Third World War. And this is a Zapatista analysis of how the world has shifted since the fall of the Soviet Union. Between the Second World War and the fall of the Soviet Union in 1990, these were wars among states for state territory. After the fall of the Soviet Union and capitalism uh, considers itself to be victorious, they argue that we are now in a fourth world war situation where all of these states, China, Russia, right? All of these, they're capitalists now. They've been capitalists, but now they're capitalists. So capitalism has now is now the enemy against humanity, against life. So now we're in a total global war. And when you think about it, when you talk to some leftists, authoritarian leftists, especially who are very fetishized the state, they often talk about the need to align with any state that is critical of the United States. And you can hear them talking about, like they'll, they'll say things like China is our greatest hope you know, completely ignoring the colonial nature of China. And as we mentioned earlier, like it seems more benevolent today vis-a-vis -vis the United States, but so did the United States back in the day vis-a-vis -vis the British empire, right? These are new faces of what they call the capitalist hydra, which we talked about a few days ago, but you never get to hear them really talk about an anti-capitalist politics. They're just focused on states. And this is like proof of what they're saying in action. It's capitalism versus humanity versus life. If we're just focused on states, we're not going to be able to recognize that the function of nation states has changed. Sovereignty has shifted away from the nation state toward global capital. Nation states are administrators. They're, it's a global plantation is what they say. And the politicians are just the middle managers or overseers of those plantations. And what we've seen under what's sometimes called neoliberalism is that states stop serving their social welfare functions of schools and health and all of that. And they become uh, 
they become bodies that make sure that there is a good, healthy, quote unquote, business climate, which means protecting private property and dispossessing anyone in resistance, killing off anyone in resistance. So the fourth world war is the context that they consider ourselves to be under. It's something to really think about um, to see if that, if that matches up with the context that, that you're all in, in your own geographies. If you'd like to read more in a, in a really beautiful way, uh, there is a book that's now out of print, but you can find at the Anarchist Library, Beyond Resistance, Everything by El Quilombo Intergalactico. It was the formation I was a part of that I joined after the book was published. It's an interview with Subcomandante Marcos following the Sixth Declaration to talk about Zapatismo and the United States. And it has a lot of this theory laid out and it's something that it also prints the Sixth Declaration of the Lacandon Jungle as an appendix. So you can also get the Sixth Declaration there along with some um, uh, popular political theory, and then the interview with Sub Marcos. And again, we're going to share these slides with everyone. So if you're taking notes furiously and you think you're going to miss something, please don't worry. So this presentation is actually very much inspired by the Black radical tradition, as well as the Zapatista movement and Mesoamerican philosophy. And I will point out similarities um, uh, when, 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 when I see them, but you might see many, many more. What we're uh, talking about then is ontology of the world, the world, the dominant world that we're in, which I want to say right away is not the only world that exists. There are many worlds that exist. It's just that the dominant world created in 1492 has sought to make itself be the only world that we can all live. The only way to be in the world is by following their logic and practice. So those two things, it's not just ideas, it's also practice, logic and practice. And what that world did was it split in their minds and then in practice, the globe into Europe and non-Europe. And the reason for that is because in a lot of Western philosophy, there is already an assumption that the stranger is an enemy rather than the stranger is a mystery. No, the stranger in Western philosophy and political thought, the stranger is an enemy. There's always, a, there, are, there are frenemies. There are no friends, right, in politics. There's always a possible, everyone's in competition with each other. And so what they wanted to do, because Europe was warring internally, they wanted to create a space of peace in that territory that was being created called Europe, modern Europe. And in order to do that, they needed to export their violence outside, which is why you see piracy, for example, like y'all go fight over there, just don't bring it over here. This is the root of international law. International law really applies to, or applied to Europe, to the, to the territory of Europe, everywhere else it didn't. And which is why so much of the rest of the world got the death and destruction that the creation of modern Europe um, was, had, to, had to meet out. Their contradictions bracketed out. You see this too with capitalism, like with the enclosures, the taking of land of people in Europe, lots of resistance against that. How do they resolve some of that? Oh, go to the colonies over there. There's lots of land over there. Go settle that, right? And so then the oppressed become the oppressors of others. This is very much what we've seen over the last 500 years. Next slide. With the creation of the League of Nations with the United Nations, with decol decolonization struggles, of course, there was a shift in empire that we're now living. And that shift is that, well, we're all equal now. Universal human equality, that's the United Nations, for example. But what, and so what it did is it created this figure of the political human that needs to be protected, human rights. But it didn't get rid, it didn't critique it didn't get rid of the logic of the friend enemy duality, right? So if you, have, if you have something under Western political philosophy, you need to have its negative in order for it to make sense. And that negative is usually something that you need to crush, it's an enemy. So if you're gonna have human rights, now you have the problem of defining, so what's a human? Well, now you have to define the non-human. And what we've gotten is communists, 
quote unquote terrorists being called that, right? As the non-human realm. So today we're living in a situation under human rights, quote unquote, where there is a non-human that makes this human possible. It's a little abstract, but I think that maybe we we, we might be able to feel if I if, I don't know if I can if 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 there's any if I need to clarify anything, please do raise your hand. Um, but this is where it, it, I think it'll start getting clearer. But this is what we're living. We're still in this duality of competition, and not just competition above and below, superior and inferior. We see this contradiction in the nation state. You have a citizen defined vis-a-vis -vis what it's not, the non-citizen, right? And this was some, a problem that nationalism has had. For example, with, with the French Revolution, now you have a problem of who's the nation. If the nation's going to rule, no, no longer monarchs, who's the nation? Well. You're not French, you're not French, you're not French. You know, that's how French is defined. And this is where you start getting anti-Semitism, for example, not just in France, but throughout Europe. Something that I've seen this quite a bit, and I accompany the Palestinian struggle quite fiercely. They've been some of my great mentors. Something that I learned in accompanying that struggle because it was so heartbreaking to me learning how Israel was created. I had no idea Israel was created by the destruction of other peoples, I mean, Palestinians. And what the decolonization moment, the decolonial moment has done of universal human equality is it has allowed some of us from below to go above in order to make empire look far more benevolent than it actually is. And it confuses us a lot of the time, you know? So here in Israel, the situation is that it was created as a place so that Jews could be in a peaceful place. War then was exported out to non-Jews. And the thing is, is that the Jewish liberation struggle had a lot of debates about how to move forward. And sadly, the one that won is the one that appealed to empire. Appeal to empire to let empire know how it could be useful to it in the Middle East in order to receive protection. If we go back, this communique from 1994 helped me with this contradiction. Notice that Marcos is a Palestinian in Israel and a Jew in Germany. Marcos is not just a Palestinian. I don't think Marcos would say he's a Palestinian in the United States. Like that's like an upper middle class white uh, situation. At least before 9-11, that's absolutely the case. After that, there's really interesting things that happened with Arabs in terms of whiteness being stripped away, right? Marcos is a Jew in Germany. Notice the context. Context is important. Why? Because those are the positions of below. Marcos is always the below. They, the below that that attacks the above in resistance, right? Here's an example of how this is being put in practice, this logic. This just happened a couple of years ago in October, 2021. Israel designated six Palestinian human, right groups, human rights groups as terrorist organizations. And here they are. There are organizations that do everyday life world making research development, law, women, children, prisoners, and farmers. Like these are the terrorist organizations. They're just not human for the Israeli uh, context because they're non-Jewish. And the thing is I could put is, uh, Israel or Jewish and Palestinian, except that that's not really true because there are many Jewish Palestinians that were living in Palestine for a really long time. But the state of Israel created a situation where you could no longer be Palestinian, you had to be Israeli now and speak Hebrew. You can't, you know, they, they discouraged from speaking Arabic. Again, another contradiction, white supremacy. White is above, non-white is below. But it's not just white supremacy, it's also anti-blackness because as we know, those of us who are not black but are also not white, we are in context, so for example, me as a brown native woman in an anti-Black context, well, in a white supremacist anti-Black context that is the United States, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a white woman, I am below. Vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Black woman, I am above. Notice that really important context shift. 
these contexts shift it in any instance. It's not just a specific geography where these identities are always eternally the same below or above. Patriarchy, male and non-male. Capital, value and non-value. A couple of days ago, we were talking about what is capitalism. Capitalism's contradiction is with by Marxism is largely understood as a as a worker owner or worker boss contradiction. Well, that exists at the level of still within the realm of the human because the worker has rights, but the enslaved African does not fit in there. They're the below. The Native American who's closer to quote unquote nature is the non-human, right? And so this is a bigger contradiction that capital is that the worker boss contradiction is operating and it's a big limitation of Western Marxism when they just see that the worker and the boss are the ones in struggle. They're not looking at the bigger contradiction of capital that it's those that are valued and those that are not valued. That is the big contradiction or bigger contradiction. Oh, you mind going back? Uh, one more, just to make sure we didn't. Yes, thank you. We can go for it then. So then yesterday, William C. Anderson uh, shouted out Martin Sostre's uh, analysis that yes, there are those cages we call prisons. Those are the maximum security prison. But the society we live in is in a minimum security prison. It's, it's a whole, it acts as a unity. The above and the below, the superior and the inferior, the valuable and the non-valuable, they are a unity that we have here in circle. And so for us, here's a question. In your context, because there is a line, right, between the above and the below, in your context, what does this line look like? And please feel free if you want to shout it out or maybe you want to think about it a little bit more. But I can give a suggestion. If I may. The police are that blue line. They police who should be where, right? And this is a, here is an, a graphic from Black Panther artist Emory Douglas. It's all the same. The local police, the National Guard, the Marines, you know, like we can think about the US-Mexico border also as actually like a, a line that way where there's peace on, in the North and war in the South, like the drug war. Those drugs come up here. They're for the consumers up here to live in a relatively peaceful place. The war happens in Mexico. The bloodshed for them happens largely in Mexico. This is actually, and, and I had drawn this as a blue line without even really putting this together. The thin blue line, if you've heard this phrase before, the thin blue line is a term that typically refers to the concept of the police as the line which keeps society from descending into violent chaos, right? This is why when we hear from the black radical tradition, I'm not against police brutality, I'm against the police. They're against the division of us in this way. So then here in our minimum security prison called the dominant world that we're all living in, often what we're given as the only solution if we're below, if we're facing death and destruction, if we wanna survive is to go above. And this for a lot of us is assimilation, right? And we can't think of anything outside of that. And the thing is, is that our reality tells us that this is true, that this is the truth all of the time. Ethically, though, it makes a lot of sense. We want to survive, and so we want to go above. Like, for example, like go to school. That means like getting a you know a title or a degree that makes you above, for example, your parents if you're from a, an, an immigrant community, right? You're better than your parents, you're above. There are so many contexts where this happens. But ethically, to go above means requiring a below, means that we are crushing others when we go above. And sadly, this is what has also happened with Zionism, with the state of, with the state of Israel, 
right? The option, the only option the political Zionist uh, founding fathers could really imagine was this. And the reality said that that was true. The material world said that that was true. Sadly, the Palestinian leadership is doing the same thing. They make a distinction over between the good Palestinians and the bad Palestinians, you know, uh, between the, the, uh, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and, and Hamas in Gaza, for example. This is, I think, one of the beautiful ways the Black radical tradition and the Zapatista struggle together because they refuse, they refuse it. And when we hear marunage, marunage, escape, fugitivity, right? They say, no, I don't wanna live like that. It is, it is not my ethics, it's not correct, it's not the world I want, so I need to flee. And this is what the enslaved Africans did when they would flee the plantation system, get together with Native Americans, get together with Europeans too, who are like, I don't like this world either. Let's go, let's go create something else, right? Escape. If you'd like to read more about the above and the below, there is a really beautiful communique called Them and Us, the sixth. And I have some excerpts here. Would anyone like to read so it's not just my voice? Maybe several people, maybe like one sentence, the next sentence. Can we do that? I don't know if this microphone can handle it, but oh, yeah. If folks want to line up, it's to read a sentence. Because I think it's really important for us to read the Zapatista's actual words, because you're going to understand like why so many of us love their communiques. It's, it's medicine for a lot of us. Adelante. You want me to read a sentence? Yeah, the okay. first sentence and then the next. Yeah. Okay. First we could, as someone might advise, wait patiently for those above to destroy themselves without acknowledging that their insane arrogance and pride will destroy everything. In their drive to be higher and higher above, they dynamite the floors below, the foundations, the building, the world will ultimately collapse and there won't be anyone to hold responsible. We think that yes, something is wrong, very wrong but that if in order to save humanity and the badly damaged house it inhabits, someone has to go, then it should be, it must be those above. And we aren't referring here to banishing those above. We're talking about destroying the social relations that make it possible for someone to be above at the cost of someone else being below. That last line, right? We don't focus just on identity. There isn't an eternal identity that is eternally above and eternally below, eternally oppressed or eternally oppressed. The problem is the social relations that put us in this condition. And I think about someone like Malcolm X, who in the last year of his life has some incredible theorizing happening as he was getting to know other parts of the world, in particular Africa. He has a really beautiful, so many, but the last message is uh, a speech he gave days before he was assassinated. And in it, he talks about in his trip to Africa, this is after he left the Nation of Islam. And he had learned in the Nation of Islam about white devils, that white people are eternally evil and all of that, right? And he's in Ghana with Nkrumah, who's invited him you know, as like an ambassador to Black Americans. And he's in Algeria had just successfully defeated the French after over a million martyrs war. And Algeria is in Northern Africa, it's Arab country or largely Arab country. And for Malcolm X coming from the United States, Arabs in this country are white, right? And so he's there sharing space with the, uh, I believe it was an, the ambassador to Algeria in Ghana. And he's listening to Malcolm, you know, talk about the struggles of black people in the United States. And he's repeating a lot of what he learned from the nation of Islam, white devils, all that, blue eyed devils, all that. And he patiently listens. And then he asks Malcolm, so what about me? Malcolm knowing, wow, this, this guy's actually a revolutionary. Like, what am I going to, so it was like a, 
a short circuiting, very, very productive short circuiting, circuiting for Malcolm in that he realized at that moment, in that context, to be white is just, it's, you're incidentally white. It's just like your adjective. You're just lighter skinned white, right? In the United States, white adjective is connected to white, I'm the boss. It's connected to a structural position of superiority, right? So our task is to split those. Let's all just be adjectives, right? And our beautiful differences, rather than demanding, expecting, maintaining these structural positions that make difference ranked in superior and inferior. So that's, when, when I read this line here, I thought about Malcolm, like we need to undo the social relations right, that, that put us there. So it's not just about attacking a certain identity group or a certain anything, right? It's about the world that creates that. We have more to read. I would, we, if some folks wanna come up and read some more, we can get the next slide. The Zapatistas know that this great line we have drawn across the world geography is not a conventional understanding. We know that this model of above and below bothers, irritates, and disturbs some. This is not the only thing that irritates them, we know, but for now, we are referring specifically to this discomfort. We could be mistaken, quite likely we are. The thought police and knowledge inspectors will surely appear in order to judge, condemn, and execute us. Hopefully only in their flamboyant writing and not hiding their vocation as executioners behind that of judges. Uh, but this is how the Zapatistas see the world and its motives. Second minute. There is machismo, patriarchy, misogyny, or whatever one might may call it, but it's one thing to be a woman above and something completely too different to be one below. There is homophobia, yes, but it's one thing to be a homosexual above and something very different to be one below. There is disdain for those who are different, yes, but it's one thing to be different above and quite another to be so below. There is a left that is an alternative to the right, but it is one thing to be the left above and it is something completely different, we would say opposite, to be the left below. Place your own identities within the parameters we are laying out and you will see what we are saying. So when we had our conversation on dialectics and how a lot of our movements, like we tackle one contradiction, another one comes up. I think because we're focusing only on identity and not on the ways that we're treating each other and not on the ways that power is circulating. When the Zapatistas write about power, and they're not the only ones, but they make a distinction over power that creates and power that destroys. Power is a creative and a destructive force. There is power over. A lot of the time, they'll use a capital P to talk about that power, power over. And there's also power to, like the potentials to create, right? And so if we're not focused on how power is circulating within our movements, within our worlds, right? Then it can very easily become power over and then we replicate the same thing. And for what? We've done all of this work, all of this dying and for the same shit, right? And this is the other face of the capitalist Hydra, another one that has grown. Why? Because we're focused just on identity, on the face of the Hydra and not on the entire beast and its habitat and its fuel. Right. And a lot of the time we ourselves help fuel it. We're not the only ones. Obviously, it is the foundation is violence. Our participation maintains it. Our, our need to want to go above maintains it. Right. Anytime we, we think of ourselves to be better than other people, 
we maintain it. That's already that structural position of superiority and inferiority. So questions, right? Why not from above and to the left? And why not from below and to the right? This leads us to ask questions, right? Above and to the left is, I think we're familiar, authoritarian leftists, right? Authoritarian anti-capitalists, right? The ones that fetishize the state. They want to be in those positions that rule us or rule others. They don't believe in the below. They don't believe in the people. They believe they have all the answers. Marxism, Leninism is one of the easy ones, punching bags for this, but that's you know, well-deserved in that way, right? Because the idea that you need an elite that's gonna tell the people what to do. And this is actually how the first six Zapatistas understood the world. They were Marxist Leninists who go into the jungle to organize the indigenous people, the Maya. By the way, the Maya are still alive, right? We're still here. It's not a dead civilization. And what they ended up doing, which was really important, otherwise we wouldn't even be talking here. They humbled down. They realized, holy shit, they're already organized. Like what they really wanted was military training. <laughs> like we really need to defend ourselves, right? And part of, of a, a, a very recent prehistory to the Zapatistas is liberation theology. Ashanti Austin talked about it yesterday. And if you read the literature, the liberation theology literature in Chiapas taking place in the years right before the first Zapatistas came in 1983, already in the 70s, their prayers, their songs were saying things like, we must not crush others and we must not crush ourselves, right? It's not, it's not crush anybody, including us, right? You see so much of their political praxis and, and the circulation of power. If you wanna read any of those, um, you, will find, you will find that a lot of the ways that they see the world, it's like a spirituality, we wanna call it that, an ideology, a philosophy, whatever it is that we wanna call it. The worldview, the cosmovision is very much in this way, something that the Zapatista movement has maintained. And liberation theology was actually the, the archbishops themselves allowing themselves to be radicalized by the native peoples in the Americas. And instead of imposing the word of God on them, what they learned to do was look for the word of God in the everyday practices of the people. It's already there. Just point them out. So here, Huey Newton, this was actually in a, a statement of solidarity with the Palestinian struggle in 1970, said, we need to create a world in which all people can live. The Zapatistas wanna be a little bit more specific today, a world where many worlds fit. This, if we think about the third world war with NATO or Soviet, NATO, being the first world, the Soviet Union being the second world and the rest of the world, many other states being like, we're the third world, we don't want anything to do with you all. But then they were forced to pick a side. They were gonna be either first world or second world, right? So then either way, those two worlds were battling to see which world was going to win. And the Zapatistas were like, no, we cannot be imposing a way on everybody. We need to respect our differences. So this is then the challenge. How do we build a world where many worlds fit, not just a world where we can all live. We need to be specific that we need to respect difference. This is just a, this is just a graphic uh, of what that might look like. This is a maroon from a book about the Jamaican maroons, it's an image, and then leaving outside, of course, holding a weapon, why? Because you can't just escape and you think that you're gonna be okay. Imagine you're a runaway enslaved person. No, they're gonna come back and get you, why? Because the master is nobody without you. The master still wants to be master and therefore needs a slave. It's going to be a violent revolution unless the above decides it does not want to be above. Now, I'll leave it all to you in your own context to see if you can get that done somehow. Hopefully, like that is what needs to happen. 
the masters need to stop deciding that they're going to be masters and just be people, just be regular people, because in order to be a master, you need the slave. So runaways, you need, we, we're all always needing to defend ourselves, warding off, recapture, right? Constant fugitivity. And so how, right? A world where many worlds fit, how? How do we circulate power in a way that it's not power over? The Zapatistas have offered us something called mandar obedeciendo, which means to lead by obeying. Anyone in a leadership position needs to obey, obey whom? The people, the, and they assemble. Extremely like high direct democracy, really, really slow, right? Decision-making, collective decision-making. They have an army, the army is hierarchical, but the army has subordinated itself down to the assemblies, to the people. You can read about that in the Sixth Declaration. And they've realized the need to do, I mean, how, if you're gonna have a security question, you can't call an assembly every time you need to do something, right? But you also need to be accountable and you, and, and you can't be led on your own. You need to be led by the people. So if you're going to be a leader, you need to obey, not command. Represent, not supplant. Supplant is like to replace. An example of supplanting that they've given us is if you have a representative out in an assembly for your village and there's a proposal for your village, and if you don't like that proposal, and if you say that, well, we just don't like it. Well, you've already supplanted the voice of the assembly of the village because you haven't even told them about it. To go below, don't go above. Don't ever think you're better than anybody else to serve, not serve oneself, which is something that the politicians need a reminder of, right? Constantly. By the way, the Zapatistas do not have politicians. They don't pay, and there's no sound, there's no careers in this. Everyone is capacitated to learn to be part of the government and there are rotating positions. So that that helps disperse power. It also wards off corruption because it's easy to buy off a politician um, and actually worth your money if you know they're gonna be there for a long time. But if the position is gonna keep rotating, it's gonna be costly to keep having to buy some. So they have these, the, these ways that they've devised to ward off corruption. And it's not to say that they're, oh, they're just so perfect, natives are just amazing, they're just inherently with one, beautiful with nature, all of that. No, like we are all fallible. All of us in, in any context can become the above if we're like in, in bare survival mode, which is why it's so important too, that they have themselves intervened in all of those things that we need to survive. Education, health, justice, economy, all of those things, right? Because it's not just about saying no, it's also about a yes. They call the no being a rebel, to be in rebellion is to say no, to be in resistance is to create your yes that can maintain that no. To convince, not defeat. To build, not destroy. To propose, not impose. So rather than a structure of above and below, they talk about side by side. This is something that the Zapatista women in particular have offered us because when we talk about gender feminism in their struggles, and there's a lot of patriarchy still within a lot of Maya communities that, are, that have learned this behavior from colonialism or trying to ward it off. They say, we don't wanna cancel the men, we love the men. Like, and we've heard this in this space too before, Jonaina mentioned it, right? Like it's not about canceling the men right? It's recognizing we're in a system that makes us hurt each other. And so how do we do that? And how do we like not try to be like the men, right? Like how do we not try to be like the oppressor, which is like what a, a liberal feminism usually does is it tries to like prove that you can oppress just like men can, you know? And so what the women have, what they do is they talk about walking a la par, side by side with our differences. And not only and, and the thing with gender in Mesoamerica, gender 
is understood really as interiority and exteriority. Femininity as interiority, masculinity as exteriority. We have both. We all have interior parts and exterior parts of ourselves. Some of us emphasize some more than others and it changes in context and there's a fluidity within that. So there isn't like an imposition of gender roles, right? And so side by side, this is something that is so philosophically deep when we think about what makes us equal in a Western society, right? And we can go back to Aristotle and the Greeks. There's a philosopher called Heraclitus who said, you cannot step in the same river twice. Why? Because the river has changed and you have changed. So his was a philosophy of constant change, right? Whereas Aristotle in trying to create kind of like a democracy in a way with still in a slave society, right? It was moving towards sameness. In order for you to be equal, you need to meet these criteria, right? You need to be, for example, a property owner or speak whatever language. And we still have that today with assimilation. You, you, you feel it all the time when you come from an undocumented migrant community that you need to be equal to, you need to be the same as, reach the level as, right, whiteness. And so it begins with the assumption of inequality, and then you move toward a sameness to reach equality. The Zapatista women say, no, we're equal because we are different. Start with the premise of equality and difference. Difference in, in recognizing that it's biodiversity that makes this planet function in such a beautiful way. I do popular education using, sometimes using popular cinema. And one of my favorites, although I don't really like, like a lot of it is the X-Men. Because out of all of the superheroes, there isn't a singular superhero, there is a collective of superheroes that have different powers. And together, they do quite marvelous things, far more marvelous than they can do individually. And so that's like a way to be able to recognize how with difference in a collective, we can be more powerful if we start to really understand ourselves as different. And this is a question too about the collective and the individual. Like it's not about the collective making everybody the same. Like, like we would think about like with the Soviet Union, right? Everyone gets the same, everyone is the same. It's not that at all. It's about recognizing what makes you different, what makes you different, what makes you different, and, and, and how we can allow all of us to live into those beautiful superpowers, those unique superpowers that we have in a collective space to, be, to, to create a different world where difference is respected, where instead of above and below, we truly are walking side by side. To read more about the specific practice about this, there are some textbooks that the Zapatistas gave us when they invited us to their little school. The little school was in 2013, 2014, and it was an opportunity for us to interface with the basis of support rather than just the army all the time. Usually when you go to Chiapas for an encounter, it's the army that we're interfacing. This was an opportunity for us to live for a few days with a Zapatista family and get to see how it is that they live. Like, what are their schools look like? What is the, the food growing look like? What are the cooperatives and collectives look like? How do women participate? And they came out with these textbooks. Now, I have uh, links to all of these textbooks in the English translation in the PowerPoint. So if you click on any of the images, you'll, you'll be able to download them and read them. And it's in the Zapatista's own words. And they very specifically show you how they run their autonomous government. They have two books, Autonomous Government One and Autonomous Government Two. Women's Participation in Autonomous Government that talks about, they give you a long history of patriarchy and everyday life and how they try to ward off from that. And Autonomous Resistance. And that one is a lot about their cooperatives and their, maybe what some would call their solidarity economy, but they themselves, their own economies and how they have cooperatives and they use that money, for example, to be able to fund the travel for someone to participate into the in the government or, or, or to do collective projects. The women's participation, it talks about the need to raise little boys 
different from the very start, not raise them as machos. A lot of the time under patriarchy, women, even though they're oppressed, will raise their boys, their sons to be machos, to be these patriarchs. Why? Because even though they don't have power in a patriarchal society as women, they raise their boys to be mama's boys and do whatever the mama wants. And then they have power to intervene in the world through their sons. And so then they continue the cycle. And so the Zapatista women talk about the need for them to raise their boys to know how to cook, to know how to clean, to know how to care for the children. Why? Because when they grow up and they have their families, and if they get married, then they're, they're going to prevent their the, the women, their wives, from participating in government because the, the woman's not going to want to go because the household is end up being a mess and the kids won't be taken care of, right? And it's all up to her, so she won't be able to participate. And so it's very important to raise boys, to not be machos, to not expect a servant and learn to clean up after themselves, to feed themselves and to do all of those life-giving things and care work themselves as well and contribute. Here are some recommended writings. We talked about a couple of days ago, this book, Critical Thought in the Face of the Capitalist Hydra. This was from a 2015 encounter where they started to um, offer this metaphor of capitalism as a hydra uh, with many heads modeled after uh, the, the myth of Hercules who had to cut off, had to kill a beast that had many heads and every time cut off one head, another one grew back, another one grew back. And they talk about how capitalism seems to function that way. And not only do other heads grow back, but oftentimes it's the head of our desires, those things that we've been fighting for. So like if we've been fighting for like, a women's participation, queer participation, black participation, right? Then we'll see those faces up above. And it's kind of confusing because then we think we won, right? But then the beast continues and it's harder to fight. Another book is Mexico Profundo, Reclaiming a Civilization by Guillermo Bonfil Batalla. This book talks about how Mexico is still very, very indigenous in its practice, even though it's a colonial settler colonial project that has wanted it to be European facing. And a lot of the government is that way, a lot of the media, if you ever watch telenovelas from Mexico, it's all like lots of blonde people, Europeans, right? And, and the brown folks are usually like the servants, you know, and it's, that's the imaginary Mexico he talks about. He says that everyday life practices of uh, many indigenous peoples are still around. In Mexico, the state has sadly tried to uh, quash the speaking of other native languages. And it's really interesting because it's a, usually uh, if we grow up in the United States, we're told that Native Americans, that it's just those that exist within the borders of the United States or like north of Mexico, right? Canada has Native Americans, U.S. And for some reason, Mexico doesn't have any Native Americans. There's Mexican, right? Or Guatemala. They're all Guatemaltecos, right? These are colonial projects that are trying to exterminate Native peoples. And even in the United States, to be Native, officially, quote unquote, is to be recognized by Washington, D.C. To be Native in Mexico and Central America you're considered native if you still speak your native language. Mexico did a lot of work, sadly, after the Mexican Revolution to try to create this Mexican national identity that homogenized everybody into this idea of Mexican and prevented a lot of communities from speaking their own languages. And Bonfil Batalla talks about, it's not, it's not just the language, it's the practice, it's the way we are in the world, it's that, other ontology, the other way of being in the world. And after reading this book, you might be able to better read these everyday life practices and see the world differently than before. This third text here, oh, let me go back. The third text here is the Pluriverse, the Post-Development Dictionary. I mentioned earlier that the United States was seen as a more benevolent empire than the British Empire because the British Empire was like very explicitly colonial. Well, the way that the United States maintained colonialism is by calling it something else. They called it development. 
right? All of a sudden, most of the world found themselves to be underdeveloped and the United States had to go in there and develop everybody according to what capitalism's development was like, not according to what the communities wanted for their own development, right? So many years ago, there is a, a post-development dictionary that talks about that post-development dictionary that um, one of my professors, Arturo Escobar, was part of, and he's part of now, like trying to really theorize, do this work. What does it mean a world where many worlds fit? And they talk about the pluriverse, not the universe, the pluriverse. They talk about the imposition of a one world world from 1492 forward, and how that attempts to crush other worlds that are still around, that are still fighting, that are still existing. And so this dictionary is really helpful because it, it takes that critical lens and it has these key words that are really helpful. Like if we're just trying to learn, like what is, what is this word? What does solidarity economy mean? Or what is, it has all kinds of entries with a critical lens and so super highly recommended. And then the next slide has other recommended writings. There's so many, but I just had to pull out a couple. One of them is about a philosopher named Luis Villoro. Luis Villoro was in, at UNAM, at the Autonomous National University of Mexico, and was one of the, the big philosophers of Latin America. He just passed away uh, in 2014, I believe. Um, and what his obsession was, was the left and all of those contradictions that keep on arising. He saw like revolutionary movements in Cuba, for example, all over the Soviet Union, all of that. And saw that, why do they keep creating oppression? Like, why do we keep becoming the monsters that we're trying to fight, right? And so when the Zapatista uprising came, he was very inspired and they connected quite a bit. And his philosophy is one about context first, how is power circulating, domination circulating, happening in a context, and then tell me what those identities are that are being shuffled. Don't begin with identity first, okay, because that can change. Not that identity is not important, and not that there is, seems to be constantly, right, for example, anti-Blackness seems to be a constant in the one world world, right, but Barack Obama was not is not part of that. He was the head of empire. So then that that really uh, challenges us to shit to to really recognize. Let's talk about context and power, and then how are those identities shuffling? So Luis Villoro does not have a lot of stuff in English. So what I'm recommending is a writing by a professor in a uh, I think he's in in Texas A and M. Uh, from Radical Philosophy Review, who talks about his thought and how it's different from the thought of the decolonial school that I don't know if some of you know, but it, it's a it's a school of thought, uh, pretty, it's growing in academia that kind of begins with non-Europe and Europe and kind of like switches it to say that non-Europe is superior and Europe is inferior. I'm being very crass, but it really does come off like that way too much, like even to the point where they say you shouldn't be reading these Europeans like Foucault or Marx or whatever. You're not, yeah, you're nodding and you've heard this. And it's not very helpful. So this article in talking about the difference between Luis Villoro's thought and the decolonial school is really helpful also really interesting and it's, uh, and it's also in the Capitalist Hydra book. After Luis Villoro died, and we would see him all the time in Chiapas in these encounters, you know, giving talks. After he died, the Zapatistas had an, uh, an homage to him and his wife and his son are sitting there. And his wife, Fernanda Navarro, is, is incredible. She's got her own story, like, and his son is in uh, their own stories, right? They learned just like everybody else, from the Zapatistas who said it, Luis Villoro was secretly a Zapatista. He joined the organization, but they didn't want to tell anybody until after he died. So if you want to read a philosopher, a Zapatista philosopher, it would be Luis Villoro. Again, unfortunately, not a lot of his stuff is translated into English, but this could give you a nice introduction. The next text then is Silvia Marcos, who is another intellectual, who gets um, called in by the Zapatistas constantly to help ward off the liberal feminists whenever the Zapatista women are doing something. Like she knows their philosophy, she knows Mesoamerican philosophy, and she's very much allied. 
Um, I translate her work. I translated this one. And sometimes I joke that I think that she might be a Zapatista and we're not going to find out until she dies. But I don't, I'm just making stuff up. Uh, but this one here, this was a piece that she wrote after the Escuelita, after the little school, using the textbooks to talk about what has happened to the Zapatista women's revolutionary law today, you know, decade, 20 years on. So the Zapatista women's revolutionary law was a law that they passed internally to themselves in 1993. So this was before the uprising with the Mexican government, against the Mexican government. And it talks about, and, and that law, that law they understand as the first uprising. They had to have an internal uprising against patriarchy before they could find themselves ready to take on the state. And that was something that was passed pretty contentiously uh, two comandantas had to go to every single village to convince, it took years, you know, to convince uh, the, the communities to pass it. And so this piece talks about how it is lived today and, you know, reading through the textbooks that the Zapatista shared with us, she pulls it out, she, she gets really philosophical as well, like talking about how their, theory, how, how their political theory, it's not, it's not just this practice that we should just be in solidarity with because they're Native American. No, they're, they're offering something really big for us, for all of us, that it's not for us to copy, it's not for us to model, but it's for us to really be inspired to think at that level, the level of everything. That's the end of the presentation. I'm excited for the conversation. I hope we have time. If you'd like to contact me, I have a website where I have some of my translations and uh, other things, and it's at kiki.org, spelled Q-U-I-Q-U-I.org. And I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Kiki. That was amazing um, and very efficient. We have a full 25 minutes for further discussion, Q&A, and everything else. Um, Kiki wanted to keep us in uh, one room for, for thoughts. So we have the mic on that side. We have the mic on this side. Um, if you have things you want to ask, um, please line up. If you've spoken you know, multiple times in the mic this week, just defer to um, anyone else coming up who hasn't? And, um, you know, I can adjudicate a little bear, bit there if needed. Uh, but um, do you want to start us off, Dayton? Sure. Uh, can you hear me through this? Um, yeah, thanks so much. That was incredible. Um, I was thinking about uh, how you were saying how that, like, human, non human binary um, replaced, like, the earlier Europe, not Europe binary and kind of coincided with the, you know, post-World War II human rights era. And I'm thinking about how in those decades beginning right after World War II marked the acceleration of all these, um, you know, these trends in terms of like fossil fuel burning, destructions of rainforest prairies, all sorts of habitats, factory farming, industrial fishing, that, you know, the expansion of driving and roads and, and cars that were not only, though they were very much violence against the humans who found themselves at the bottom of that hierarchy, they were also violence against literal non-human entities, you know, individual animal species ecosystems. And I'm wondering, yeah, what the dissolution of that binary means for, for I guess like actual non-humans and for our ecological, for human ecological relationships with, with the non-human world. And if that's something, uh, you know, Zapatistas have written, spoken much about, or, or what your thoughts are. Yeah, just thank you for that question. Briefly, what I can say is you'll 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 hear in the recent discourse over the last few years, I'm talking about the struggle is for life. It's not just for humanity, right? It's for life. What I they have helped me. Uh, 
understand capital volume one, the commodity better than a lot of other readings that I've done in that, you know, when, when we talk about capitalism and we talk about commodity production, and I, I pointed out the other day, for example, paper, right? The waged worker has rights, right? To be compensated for their work, but what about the tree, right? Did the tree get asked if they could be cut down? Did the tree get compensated? And what is a tree? Here's the ontology question. What makes a tree a tree? Is it, is it just the, the pulp? Isn't it also the soil microbes? Isn't it also the wind that pollinate? Isn't it also the water? How could we possibly account for all of that work and compensate all of that work under capital? And the answer is that we cannot. Capitalism needs to devalorize most of the work that takes place on the planet to be able to extract power, profit. To then, under, to understand then ourselves uh, without that binary of the human and the non-human, it means to understand ourselves not just as beings that are just bodies, but we are part of nature. We are with nature. Like to destroy the planet is to destroy ourselves. And so it, it takes, it, it implies a radical shift of how we understand being itself, that we are so interconnected. I'll leave it there. I don't know if that address a lot of your question, but I am happy to open it up because I've been talking a lot for conversation about this. Are there any books or articles that can be rec that can be recommended that focus on the structures and yeah the escuelita the little school uh, textbooks? There's history, um, but those ones are more specifically their everyday life structure. There's a really amazing dissertation by Mara Kaufman. It was written in I think like maybe 2010 or 11 or and. Um, that one is from Duke University. It's open by now because it's, it's older and it's called We Are From Before, Yes, But We Are New. And it talks about the practices and it's, a, it's an anthropology dissertation, but it's not like this outside observer anthropologist like telling us, instead uses their own words to, to, to help and, their, and, and recognizes that they are their own philosophers. They are their own thinkers. They study themselves. We don't need to study them. They tell us who they are, right? And that, that is where you see a lot about how they rotate positions, how they don't have politicians, how they don't get salaries. And, and, and it gives you a little bit more structure than some of the Escuelita books do. Hello, thank you so much for that presentation, Geeky. Um, Leah and I were talking uh, with their little brother today about the Zapatistas and their influence on the anti-globalization era. And I'm curious if you could speak to the impact of the Zapatistas in the 1990s and early 2000s and the way that they were able to impact the way that people understood social movements with the summit hopping and the attacks on the IMF and the WTO at that time period and the cultural imaginary that the Zapatistas, among others, were able to influence on the way that we understood the uh, conditions under capital at that time. Oh, thank you so much for that question. Um, and I'm grateful for the question because there I've noticed that there isn't that much memory right now with movements about the World Bank and the IMF and all of those battles that are still going on. So in 1994, when the Zapatistas rose up, surprising everybody, they surprised everybody because it was supposed to be the end of these resistance movements. Capital had supposedly won, right? And so the Zapatistas come out on the scene embarrassing the Mexican government because the Mexican government was about to join the NAFTA, the North America. 
North America is Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Sometimes, well, a lot of the time people forget Mexico, and Mexico has a massive inferiority complex about it, right? So it was joining the North American Free Trade Agreement where there was going to be free trade across the borders, right? And sadly, what happened there that galvanized a lot more support for the Zapatistas in the, on the eve of their uprising was that from the Mexican Revolution a hundred years before, the one win, if we can call it that, was that communal lands were protected by the constitution. And what NAFTA did was demand that the Mexican government remove that part of the constitution so that land could be open to sell, for sale. And what the Zapatistas did was in surprising the world, they galvanized the, and created, I, I inaugurated, I would say, the alter globalization movement. It's not that they're anti globalization, they want a different kind of globalization, alter, right? From below and to the left, right? And so what we ended, that was 1994. The next explosion was here in Seattle, 1999, with the WTO conference was shut down. And, and then you get the World Social Forum in Brazil starting, but then that has its own contradictions because they refused to invite the Zapatistas because they were an armed organization. And they said, we don't deal with armed organizations, except that they would invite nation states all the time. Like that <laughs> huge contradiction. And so then there was a lot of inspiration and it got taken away by a lot of a lot of folks that were inspired, but then interpreted it in their own way. Since then, the and, and these structural adjustment programs, uh, the, the IMF was giving loans. It, it's like a way to shift so that the nation state no longer carries out those social welfare functions and instead carries out the functions that make it a good business climate in their own countries, right? And they became heavily indebted. And in order to get these loans, they had to do these uh, structural adjustment programs. It's, it's still going on, but there isn't a lot of discussion about them. So I'm really grateful for, the, for that question. And yeah, like the, the Zapatista inspiration has, with the sixth declaration, is, that was a really controversial move on their part. They lost a lot of support from the left because a lot of the left is, you know, thinks that what's really sexy is this armed uprising, but not really the autonomy creation part. That's like everyday life, boring, not not in not Instagrammable, I guess we would say today, you know. Uh, but it also it also allowed them to see who exactly they really did want to walk with, and it, I think. With Occupy in 2011, you start seeing a resurgence in this country, interest of interest in the Zapatistas. So the Beyond Resistance book, again, was published in 2007. When we were organizing before, the, before 2008, what was 2008? Obama and the financial crisis, which then led to Occupy Wall Street, right? So that book would be really nice to, to have an update somehow of what's happened since. Right. Um, but there has been an interest since then, largely on this question of assembling and horizontality, because Occupy Wall Street was, for me anyway, the first time I saw a, a mass movement not wanting anything to do with the politicians anymore, like trying to figure it out on our own. Oh, we have a hand up. Yes. Right, Laura, go ahead, Laura. I see your hand up. Oh. Laura, we're so sorry. We're having difficulty hearing you, and it might be on our part. And we wonder if you might type uh, your question or your comment in the chat. Oh, she's still on the mic. Um, I guess. And it's also a little bit of a like piggyback off of it. It's more of just like a wondering more than a question. Um, because I know like uh one of the like key things too, even a lot of um the like building among these kind of communities was like the Zapatistas starting to use the internet. 
and like push things out like and so I know there's like yeah like there's often these like weird feelings about like technology and like how things are being surveilled but also um that we like a small movement within a nation that's like the a lot of the power came from just being able to be globally visible and so like how we navigate some of those things and especially when we're thinking about like who it is that we're in partnership with as we think beyond the borders of our issues. Like, I, yeah, it's just more of a wondering. Yeah. Thank you for that. Famously, yeah, the Zapatista in 1994, not a lot of people had access to the internet. It was not mainstreamed yet. And when the Zapatistas rose up on the scene, journalists, and they had their communiques, journalists were uploading those to the internet and they were able to get a lot of support precisely because of the, the globe's eyes were on this situation. And that still continues today, the importance of that, of that bigger geography as part of their struggle. Very recently, this past September, uh, 2022, there was a leak of the Defense Department in Mexico's emails, a massive leak that uh, showed that the Mexican government today, Lopez Obrador, who hates the Zapatistas, like they used to like kind of work together in their early years and then he betrayed them and then they refused to support him in the elections in 2006 and now he's like back with a vengeance is building these huge development projects, these mega projects kind of as his legacy. One of them is the Maya train. And that's, that's like a tourist, it's, it's destroying the rainforest and it's also crouching into Zapatista territory. And another one is the Trans Ismic Corridor, which is, um, you know, Mexico, the, the country of Mexico, the outline looks kind of like a mermaid tail and it's got a very, the, the thinnest part, that's the Isthmus. Mexico has wanted to, create a, a competition to the Panama Canal there for a hundred years. And now Lopez Obrador is pushing that forward. Um, and the Maya train, which is billed as a tourist train, it's also a train for mining and extraction to then go over to the trans Isthmic corridor, which his solution for stopping migration from Central America is that corridor to create sweatshops, maquiladoras, Exactly. And so when Trump says Mexico is going to pay for the wall, he's absolutely right. It's called the trans Isthmic corridor. That's the wall. And this is the analysis the Zapatistas themselves give us. That is the southern border of Mexico. And, and so his obsession is these mega projects. The Zapatistas are the loudest force against them. And in the leaks, we saw that uh, Lopez Obrador's own intelligence is telling him the Zapatistas can't really convoke that much support on the ground against these development projects, but you better watch it because they can convoke a lot of international support. So don't you be provoking them at that level, which is really good for us to know how powerful we can be, right, together. And so much of this, like, it's a, it's a new kind of geography of struggle because they're not struggling for the nation state. They're not trying to take state power they're not a movement of nationalism, of Mexicans. No, you have to be a member of the Zapatista organization to be considered a Zapatista, which means you have to do the work. You need to be part of the government. A lot of Zapatistas who were Zapatistas left because it's not easy. Also because to be a Zapatista, you cannot receive anything from the Mexican government. And that can be really hard to sustain, right? So this new, this geography of struggle, and thank you for that question. It's so important. It reminds me so much. It reminds a lot of us of this, of the black radical traditions, intercommunalism. And this is another really great dissertation also from Duke. And these are compas from Quilombo too that um, really, really brilliant in, in their analysis of putting these together. Um, can't go home again. It's a dissertation about Huey Newton's thought on the question of sovereignty and talks about how Huey Newton, as early as the early 70s, was already theorizing empire, the, 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 the sovereignty of the nation state shifting down. And this comes from him reading, I think it was Business Week, a magazine that, the, that, that had, you know, it was the height of the Cold War. They're interviewing an executive for one of the big motor companies. 
and is being asked, hey, how do you, uh, how do you think you're going to expand your market if all these states don't like you? And his response was, well, what flag do they like? Because we can wave whatever flag they want, right? And Huey was like, oh, like, the nation state sovereignty has shifted. This is global capital, right? And so for him, like this is an intercommunal reactionary, like webbed network of reactionaries. And a politics adequate for our time with a new geography is that we are intercommunal, but not reactionary. We are revolutionary. So that's like an intercommunalism from below, we might say in Zapatista parlance versus the intercommunalism from above. So it's a whole new type of geography. It's not nation state geography. It is networked geography. And you even see that inside Zapatista territory in the Escuelita, one of the great lessons that I learned was that even within villages, even within households, there are Zapatistas and non-Zapatistas. So even there, and that, that gave me some hope living in an urban context, because I used to think, oh, we got to take the entire city in order to, no, 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 we, this is a whole different geography of struggle. And what's really beautiful too, is that with, uh, with non-Zapatistas, they don't discriminate. They allow them to use their clinics. A lot of them even want to use their justice system because it's far more fair, far fairer than the Mexican government. And so then this allows us to ask questions about how we organize vis-a-vis -vis those of us who are not, those who are not in our organizations. Like, you know, they, they have a, Joy James talks about this in terms of, a, of uh, concentric circles like with political prisoners, prisoners of war in the middle, right? Or in the center of that, of that circle. And then those of us who would like create a circle of care around them and, and still dangerous situations, but not everybody is willing to go there. So, but maybe they can create another concentric circle around that circle and around that circle. The Zapatistas use the caracol, the snail, as, as a similar, as a similar visual, I guess, you know, where, where, where it goes out to the outside world. So they don't have this binary of you're either in our org or we hate you or you're the enemy, right? Like they understand that not everybody is going to be able to do the work, but we still need to figure out ways how we're going to relate in a, in a bigger ecosystem with our struggles. Is it okay if we, if we engage Laura's question on Zoom? And so we got, we got five more minutes. Tali, do you also have a question? Yeah. So can we do that question here from Eleanor and the Sali, and then, and then you just respond? That sounds to great. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to take a stack of three, and then, and, and Laura, so my question regards whether the Zapatistas are still fighting corporations trying to steal land, and if so, what industry, industries are posing the biggest threat? I am also wondering how much of an issue cow ranchers are in trying to take land in that region, considering what a huge role they played in trying to take land back in 1994. I don't know about the second question about cow ranchers. The first one is, is fascinating in terms of how the narcos work with the state and with corporations. There's a book by Don Paley called Drug War Capitalism that talks about how in Colombia, in Guatemala, and in Mexico, what you see a lot of the time is that native communities or communities in struggle for, to protect the land uh, get terrorized by the narcos so that the government, it looks like the government isn't doing it. They get terrorized by the narcos, get run out, and then now it's open for the government to do the, to, to sell the land or do the mining concessions to the corporations. Um, if you, there is a, an organization in Germany that recently wrote, and I'm sorry, I can't, I can find it if you want to contact me, but they just recently wrote a pamphlet about the German corporations that are benefiting from the Maya. The, the this badly called Maya train. Uh, and so that's a really great question. Also, like if, well, if we want to organize, I'm trying to find out who these paramilitaries who are also coffee growers who are attacking the Zapatistas, the Orcao, who are they selling their coffee to, right? Like we got to find that out so we can put good pressure on those, on, on those corporations. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm, I'm trying to find out if somebody knows, please let us all know and please organize us. But that's, that's actually a really important way to at least give some relief to, to, um, to the paramilitary attacks. I am sorry, I was supposed to wait for the other two, but let's just take two more and then I might not even have to answer because there, there might be comments. So go ahead. Um, 
I can be brief and and I I, I think maybe this conversation might expand um, beyond this session, but um, I was just kind of wanting to to chat a little bit about um, the fetishization in the global north uh, among the left about Latin American so-called socialist regimes like in Venezuela and Bolivia, and um, you know, that often describe themselves as eco-socialists or they put out, you know, like the, what's it, Declaration for the Rights of Mother Earth, and then they go and they mine and, you know, and they build roads and they even will bring in indigenous, so, you know, so-called indigenous leaders or elders to bless, you know, the road or the, or the mines. And, um, you know, I just kind of wanted to ask about your perspective on that and also the Zapatista perspective on that. I'm curious, you know, how and to what extent they weigh in on um, those kinds of politics outside of Mexico. I know it's a very locally rooted project. It's not their job to go around chasing people in other locations, but um, what sticks out to me, it's so powerful about the Zapatistas is how they're, they hold this line, you know? Um, and yeah, just thank you. And thank you so much for such a powerful presentation. Thank you for everything, Kiki. Um, I also have a question. I'm just wondering about the place of art, visual performance, music um, among the Zapatistas beyond this like beautiful, expansive writing that you've already shared. Thanks. On that, on that second question, um, the creative expression coming out of the Zapatista movement and, and those in struggle uh, in their orbit, you can say, is so central to a lot of their work. And what's, what's really beautiful about it is that it's ras a lot of it is rascuaches, what, how we say in Spanish. It's like it's like homemade. You can it's not like all shiny, glossy, you know, like it's and you can tell like even in the art, like it's sending a message. This is from below. This is not art from above, right? They held a, a couple of summers in a row, it was like, I think it was 2016, 2017, they held um, a festival called Comparte, which was like a play on like sharing art and, and compa, you know? And there was some really beautiful art that came out of that, that show the like different faces of the capitalist hydra this is you know they don't give us answers of how what they say the capitalist hydra's faces are like they want us to think like what does it look like in our context and so that allowed different contexts to show like how they how they understood the different faces and to eleanor's question about yeah latin america raul zibeki z-i-b-i -I -Z -I -Z -I -B -E -I, is a journalist from uruguay who writes a lot about the facade of these quote unquote progressive governments that what, what happens so often, it happened in Brazil, it happened in Bolivia, like they, you know, a lot of the movements from below bring them to power as a strategy and then they either co-opt them or try to destroy them if they don't, if they're not co-optable. Something that happened in Bolivia with the coup is leading up to that is Evo Morales had destroyed a lot of his opposition that had previously brought him into power or co-opted. And so the CIA is always going to be there. The opposition is always going to be there. But by then, he didn't have a lot of support to prevent that from happening because he had crushed a lot of it or co-opted it. And it was really hard at that time, and it still is, to actually have conversations about reality with a lot of leftists from above, the left from above, who focus so much on states and identity. Like their focus is the United States, and for them, you're a revolutionary if you say something bad about the United States. So they will even like support Bashar al-Assad, they'll support the Ayatollahs in Iran, they'll support all of these dictators, just because, just if they say something negative about the United States. And again, when are we going to talk about capitalism, right? Because Evo Morales is still uh, selling mining concessions for lithium, the United States corporations wanted them, well, yeah, so does China, he was totally fine with China. And so it's really hard to have, for example, an analysis where we begin with identity, just because Evo Morales is indigenous does not make him revolutionary, right? That's why we need to understand how power is flowing and the context and have our ethics in mind. Yeah, the Zapatistas have held that line. They have uh, made statements recently about Ortega in Nicaragua, 
who, which was another one. Uh, he was a, a former Sandinista, authoritarian, massacring or, and, and beating up any opposition uh, and likened him and his wife, who's also part of the government, to Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, saying that they're washing, they're washing their hands of blood with the, black, with the flag of black and red, you know, like just like in Shakespeare. And they, when they talk about Cuba, they talk about their solid in support of the Cuban people. They don't say the Cuban government. Like, like they make a very specific distinction with that. Can we get a hand for Kiki? Thank you. 